Hi folks, uh, this is uh, Richard here from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa and I've also got, also got a special guest here at the moment, um, Charlotte. Hi. Richard. Say hello. Hi, how are you? <laughs> and we're, 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 we're going to be talking about the night sky in a moment and some of the important things that are happening in the wire wrapper. Right, okay. Now here's... It doesn't work. <laughs> doesn't work. No. <laughs> okay, well, you just keep talking. Okay, okay. Yeah. I'm going to yeah. restart the computer. Okay. Yeah, you keep talking. Uh, okay, keep, with your keep guest, And then I'll just do this. One of the things that um, we find is that I think most New Zealanders take for granted the wonderful environment that we have here. And I th this has come home to a lot of people, I think, with the covert thing. Yeah. Having that 2,000 miles between us and the nearest landmass has actually been really good, hasn't it? Yeah. And. Um, but also things like the night sky. We just take it for granted. We've got some most magnificent night skies here. And what we don't realise is that the vast majority, and I'm talking about 80% of people in the world, have never seen the Milky Way. Isn't that true, isn't it? You know? It's amazing, isn't it? I mean, we have it. Um, for most of us, we can step outside our back door of an evening on a clear night and now have the glory of the Milky Way just above us. Yeah. And it is quite amazing... Um, for me, obviously coming from the UK, I just think it's absolutely stunning. And I've grown up with stars, but definitely nothing like this. And so when you talk to people and with the work that I do with the Dark Sky Project, it is amazing and it's sort of quite mind-blowing to realise that a lot of people that have had the pleasure of growing up here do just take that beautiful sky for granted. Um, and it's the realisation of maybe we shouldn't. Um, it is amazing, but we do want to preserve and protect That's that. right, yeah. It grants you disappears. Now, it, it's, it, there's so many things like that. I can always remember, you say you came from England, you know, and I remember when I first came to New Zealand, uh, I lived up north in Whangarei, and I used to love beaching. There's a beautiful um, coastline along there. Absolutely. My favourite was a place called Whale Bay. And you walk down through the bush, and you came to this little cove with white sands and rocks. It was magical. And when I went back to work the following day, I was talking about it, and I said, and I said I was the only person there. And the guy looked at me and said, "Why?" He said, "Did you expect somebody else to be there?" <laughs> well, you know, I I used to live near London, and if you had a nice day, you say, "Let's go down to the coast." And a million other people would think exactly the same thing. Exactly. And as I say, that's the sort of thing that you, you take for granted. And we do have these beautiful night skies here. And I think it's it's something we need to protect and preserve. And this is what came about with this uh, Dark Sky Association, wasn't it? Which I believe started in Martinborough, first of all. It did. So we're a few years in from the initial concept of the idea. So... A group of guys, um, I'm kind of guessing, were stood outside admiring the beautiful sky um, when the conversation started of, wow, we should really make sure we preserve this. This is something special. And so it will have been um, around four years ago now, I think, that um, that conversation started and went out to the Martinborough community to see if people were interested in becoming a dark sky village. And I was one of the people that picked up one of the little flyers and was totally intrigued because I'd been living in the Wairapa and thought, wow, the sky here is amazing, and got in touch. And so this is where my journey personally began. And so did the journey for the project. And quite quickly, um, that project from uh, Martinborough and the society began as the Martinborough Dark Sky Society. Um, the realisation of, um, wow, it's not just Martinborough, it's the whole region. We all have this amazing sky above us. And so the project grew and it went from the Martinborough Dark Sky Society to the Wairarapa Dark Sky Society. And here we are in the midst of the tail end of the application process to become a certified dark sky reserve um, in a two-phase project for the whole of the region, which is pretty special and amazing. Absolutely. I mean, I believe that if we get this accreditation, uh, which comes from in international, that it's going to be one of the biggest dark sky parks in the world, isn't it? Yeah, I think at the time, because obviously the process has been has taken quite a while, as it always does, the dark sky um, society, um, the International Dark Sky Society, um, detail that it can take up to three years from the concept of um, approaching them to certification, and, and we're running along that perfectly timeline. Um, but obviously there has been a lot more interest in the dark sky across the world and 
So I think at the time, about a year ago, it was looking like we would be the largest, but that has now been rivaled with a couple of others in different areas. But definitely what is quite special about our Dark Sky Reserve is that we would feature five towns, a state highway and three lighthouses. So from that perspective, I think that's what's quite unique about ours, because if you look at Dark Sky um, Reserves and places around the world, they are more remote. And so we have a real opportunity to showcase it's possible to preserve and protect when you have towns like the five towns in the region and a state highway and like I say all those different elements that are quite challenging when it comes to lighting and protecting mm. the sky. Mm. Well I mean that's the reason why I came to the wire wrap. I mean I used to live in Wellington and I came out I started being interested in astronomy and so on. I was working at Carter Observatory at the time and uh, I come out here because there's an hour and a quarter's drive from Wellington and suddenly you have these pristine night skies. So after a while I decided, hey, uh, I think I might have a place for an observatory out here. And in those days you couldn't buy anything less than 25 acres, so I ended up by buying a little farm and putting observatories on it, and a little house, one bedroom house. But now, of course, I'm supposed to have retired. I live out here permanently, but I'm actually busier than I ever have been before. <laughs> but I think one of the things that a lot of people get confused about is what 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 have we got to do to get the ticks from internationally to be actually our park? So there's quite a large process. And so the group, of, the team that are the Dark Sky Society um, are beavering away, working with so many different elements. There's lots of different facets um, in becoming a Dark Sky Reserve. So we've had to work with um, organisations like the NZTA, um, local councils around the um, lighting. Um, we're talking with um, Maritime New Zealand because of the lighthouses. We have had to engage with all of the communities um, and explain into the public sector of, of, of what that will mean. I mean, there was a sort of a misconception that there might be um, people needing to turn their lights off at 10 o'clock, which isn't true. Um, there was some concern around what would that mean about lighting at people's houses. And so one thing is that all of this protection and preservation is more around um, commercial property, new build. So all the residential, we can't enforce any um, strict guidelines or any this is what you must do element to it but we would be educating and taking people on the journey so that there's an awareness of if you're making decisions in your own property with your lighting in your garden or around your house that there is a best practice and there's a not such a great practice so anything with lighting at night you're going to be shielding down and all we need to do is light what we need to be able to see which is just pretty sensitive stuff really there's no point in having light going up into the sky and then having a detrimental effect not only to light pollution but also to insects and wildlife and it's about lighting what we need to light and doing it at times that it is needed yeah i absolutely agree that, that i always know where i am at stonehenge and uh, which is about for those who don't know it's about 10 12 k's out from carterton into the countryside and at night when it's a cloudy sky and i look over and i can see all the clouds over masterton being illuminated i wonder why the ratepayers in masterton are actually paying to illuminate the clouds <laughs> but, but because the thing is that if you put the correct type of lighting in so that it goes downwards upwards what they found in the united states is they cut the the, p the power bill down by almost 50 percent and that's been a saving of millions of dollars actually over time so it's not a matter of not having lighting it's having the correct lighting yeah in. it's yeah. all about smart lighting and like you say yes when you can explain to businesses that you're going to save them money it becomes yeah. a little bit a bit more of a light bulb moment yeah. um pardon the pun to um actually make change and so it's not that you have to do it now i mean anything any businesses that we talk to as a society um, we can go and look at what's going on and give people advice and we just suggest that they take that plan as a five-year plan mm -hmm. this is a long-term project i mean the the um society is doing all of this work 
and now but it means just this is step one in a long-term um sort of strategy for the future of protecting the sky in the Wararapa so it's not just a one tick and done we'll have to continue to to work with the councils and make sure that in the future we're future proofing this so that's what all of this work is about right, yeah. um and then educating the children of the region to understand how important it is and and why yeah it's just it's just as simple as not dropping rubbish on the side of the road isn't it you yeah. know what i mean it's yeah. actually looking after the environment we're in i'm always cer- pretty certain those people who do drop that rubbish if you went around and dropped rubbish in their back garden they'd hate you for it wouldn't they <laughs> Totally. <laughs> anyway, what I thought we'd do, we'd have a little bit of a break here and um, then we can come back and discuss some more things afterwards. Now, what I've, what I've got here is a little movie. I hope it's all going to work for you. It's, there's, we say in space and time, there's four dimensions. The fourth dimension is time. and But we've only got one view of what time's like. And when you change time, either backwards or forwards or faster, suddenly it all begins to make sense. And I've got a little movie here for you. Okay, so I'll turn it round to where we were there. Okay, and when I when I click on, let's get that up. When I click it, it's going to start. Right, ready? So this is going to have this is having a look at our beautiful environment, our night sky, and the sky above you, but looking at it in a slightly different time dimension. Is there a music? Yeah. It's music. Okay. Yeah.
Hi, right. folks. That was, uh, and when you look at something like that, you can see looking at a slightly different time frame what's happening then. And I think it's actually an important movie because when we're talking about the night sky and dark sky, we're talking about our environment that we live in. And you, everyone's heard of global warming. And they say, oh, it's actually warmer this year, so therefore global warming is due to something else. Well, what actually the big danger of global warming is, if you raise the temperature by just a small amount, that activity that you just saw, which was producing hurricanes and tornadoes, that also increases also, because the amount of energy in the environment is increasing. So with global warming, what we're going to do is have more storms, more tornadoes and things like that. And that's something to, to be beware of. Anyway... Um, over here in New Zealand, what we're looking at at the moment is preserving this night sky of ours so that we've got this one. It works two ways. It works, number one, is that um, visitors from overseas, when we open our borders again, one of the things that they love here is coming in and having a look at our night sky. But it's also pretty important for other things because native animals and birds also it affects them, doesn't it, Charlotte? Oh, totally. Um, and uh, obviously our national um, icon, the kiwi, is yeah. a nocturnal animal, which yeah. um, we have the absolute pleasure of having Pukaha Mount Bruce on our doorstep. And so all the work they do and working with those guys is really special because there's a real understanding of the importance of of this project and lighting and lighting pollution on nocturnal animals and there's been a couple of places in New Zealand of late that have had some instances where they're doing there's some really good um, scientific work um, and projects going into um, the different lighting and how that is impacting nature and I mean you'll see if you look at a light fitting at night as you're walking around all the insects around that light fitting and and that is because um, they're drawn to light that is there thinking it is the moon or and it's not where it's an artificial yeah. product and then animals unfortunately get into trouble when they're disorientated by artificial light as opposed to the natural light and it has impacts on the circadian rhythms and sleep patterns and all of these things the knock-on effect is so huge and I think it's quite a developing um, science but it's really a special place to be working in when we're part of understanding and learning about that and taking people along with us mm. on that journey. Yeah, I think as often it's not until you live and work out in the countryside that you begin to realise that how many different ways we have imp impact on our own environment. And one of the things that always sticks in my mind is that when I, when I got this piece of land where Stonehenge is now, uh, was nothing on it, no trees, and that sort of thing and if people come out there they come out there, they say lots of trees and bushes and most of them have been planted by me right when we're starting off there so that's how we started but i tell you what the amazing thing is at night the noise of wild birds out there is amazing we get parrots all sorts of things out there which just we didn't see before yeah so putting those trees back brings all the wildlife back as well totally and it's really magical and then you've got i mean you can step out and enjoy it you've got the wildlife you've got a myriad of very talented astrophotographers and astrophotography is becoming quite a big thing and mm. and the talent within the region um is just amazing um which is exciting and, and an area that the dark sky society is sort of exploring as a way to showcase and to do things with um so that's really very cool because sort of getting out and enjoying it and teaching people how to do that is is quite cool too but whole concept of just stepping outside and looking up and the the dark sky society are going to have a campaign this winter step out look up yeah. and which is going to be really cool to just encourage people in the region literally to do that on a clear night just stand outside for five minutes and take in that beautiful yeah. night sky it's also it's what you tend, you tend to take for granted i remember uh, we had this group of uh, school kids come out to Sandwich and we've got a paddock there and if they want to stop overnight they they put tents up and they were, all the kids stopped overnight and it's just the things that probably you and i charlotte are used to i went out and i, I put pointing out the stars and i said no that object up there that star you can see i said that's the planet mars and if you saw how excited those kids got that they could actually identify that's the planet mars and i suddenly realized it's you know it's just things that people are missing out on now in modern day and age isn't it actually right. learning the basic nature of what's around us at the moment and i think that's what is so special and i suppose as a way to to wrap everything into 
how cool this whole project is is I always think about like the the ways people can get outside and enjoy with the different elements like Stonehenge under the stars the dark sky society all the different things that they can do within the Wararape to go out and understand how to identify planets and a few constellations and that's what the magic is I mean if you go out at night and learn something I can always remember how I could just never find the Southern Cross and then when somebody showcased how to do that really simply it was a light bulb moment and now I can go and find it That's right, any yeah. night I want to and it's quite it's really empowering isn't it, it to is. actually walk outside and say I can never get I can work out I can work out where north, east, south or west just by looking at stars at and night and I think yeah. if we can do that to every person in the Warrapa that would be our mission yeah. complete so we're where are we up to at the moment, Charlotte? Well, I know we're having a meeting, aren't we, with all the mayors in, in the area? Hopefully having a meeting with mayors very soon. There's some exciting things happening. Um, we're, we're getting really close to putting that um, piece of documentation into the International Dark Sky Association in America. We've got the lighting survey to complete, which means there's going to be a few of us going around at night doing readings of, of public lighting. We've got the one first stage done. Um, we're, getting, we're gathering letters of support from different areas. We're doing some um, really beautiful EWI engagement and so we're just closing the loop on all of the different elements within the um, application process in the hope to have that um, wrapped up and sent off very soon. And then, of course, the next big focus is um, how we will be celebrating Matariki. Yeah, well, well, talking of Matariki, I mean, people just talk about Matariki, but I tell you what, what what's the importance, I tell you, is unfortunately it occurs at the moment uh, near midwinter where we are, and if you want to see what all the fuss is about, you actually have to get up in the early hours of the morning right, yes. to see it. But the importance is not just seeing Matariki in the sky. At that moment, Māori believed you saw the sky as it was when it was created. So the great waka in the sky is sitting along the horizon. The great house in the sky, which they always said the house was built up there by the gods, right, and then copied and built down here. And the, uh, the waka uh, itself wasn't simply the house came from turning the walk upside down and the interesting thing is that at that moment in time you can go out and you can see all of these Polynesian Maori constellations in the sky and then what happens for the beginning of the year the anchor is pulled up because the anchor is the southern cross and then the walker sails across the sky and that's something special. So that's something I know here in the Wire Upper, we're going to be teaching people and showing these people these stories and so on. So it, it leads us into our culture, what the meanings behind these things were all about in the first place. So it's something precious we need to uh, preserve. Yeah, totally. And I think that is what's quite special. We've got something that's a really cultural, significant place to um, learn about. And I think there's a real desire for that across the region of really understanding how special this is, and especially it being regional stories and things we can learn. So it's an exciting time. Yes, yeah. So, how long, how far away do you think we are from getting uh, this certification, as it were? Well, when we get the application in, which will hopefully go in at the end of May, um, we will should ho- hopefully hear quite quickly the process is. It's quite a structured process. There's certain timelines. There's um, We have to notify that our application will go in at a certain time. Then the application goes in. It's reviewed quite right. quickly. And so, <laughs> but we we will expect to hear it. Probably won't be till July, yeah. um, but it, it won't be too far away. And I can assure you there will be um, a huge fanfare and, and that news going out quite yeah. uh, with celebration after yeah. a long a long period of time and a whole lot of work by a very dedicated group of people good i mean i mean you'll find this uh uh, people get along to the the observatories that we have here in the wire wrapper go out and have a look at those stars that and relearn things that aren't you know i think as i say it's it's big it's a matter of lost knowledge i on my love of the countryside always come from my um my gran she lived out in the countryside and when you went out there all the food that you ate came from the land and if us kids got hurt, me or my sisters, mum or gran would go out into the garden, pick a herb and she'd rub it on it and it worked. 
these days we've lost all that knowledge if you yeah. if you need help you have to go to the doctors or to the chemist and things like that so i think part of what we're doing is relearning those things upon which civilization it was about built indeed the stars themselves it's totally. the very foundation of civilization navigation timekeeping and knowledge yeah and that's what built up yeah. yeah totally in the beginnings of new zealand and the stories that lie within absolutely so yeah it is a very exciting um time and a very exciting um, part of the region and what that's going to look like in the future. Yes, absolutely. Look, folks, we, we will keep you informed of what's happening. And uh, next next month, or next time I'm on here, I'll bring some on photographs. But photographs of the sky, which you might think, first of all, have been taken by giant telescopes around the world, have actually been taken by ordinary amateur photographers of the night sky. And you will be amazed at some of the pictures that I'm going to be showing you. So I knew they'll be coming along at our next night sky. Having said that... You haven't got time. What? Of pictures. No, for the next one. Oh, for the next one. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. So well, I'm going to say goodbye now, yeah. and we will be catching up with you. Charlotte? Would you like to say the last few words? Thank you for having me, Richard, and I look forward to coming back another time and sharing more updates on the Dark Sky Society. Absolutely. Yeah. So see you again soon. And Thank we'll you. Bring, next time we bring along those photographs and you can see the things that we're talking about. Okay, thanks. Bye-bye. Okay, sorry. <laughs>